So this seminar is uh, Caring for Care Partners, Addressing Burnout and Compassion Fatigue. And we're going to be looking at a number of different sort of areas for care partners to consider and things that we need to think about when we are trying to avoid burning out um, and, and hitting that point of compassion fatigue. Because obviously, if you're a care partner, and you're looking after a partner who is medically affected in some way, there's a lot you have on your plate, you are very prone to burning out. So we want to avoid that. We're going to look over a few things here and talk about um, some of the dynamics involved in care partner bur burnout. So the first thing we're gonna check out is care partner tasks. So that is essentially, we're gonna be doing a quick one over on all of the different things that care partners have to take care of um, in their day. So obviously roles and responsibilities that they take on um, are complex and varied. If you're supporting a partner with a chronic illness or cancer treatment diagnosis, there's a lot involved in taking care of that person. And a lot of different aspects are impacted by that. So care partners are involved in all these different aspects of life. The workload can be exceptionally heavy. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of hours in a day. So just to get an idea of how much is on a caretaker's plate, uh, we're going to go through three separate sections of tasks that they might have to attend to. Um, and just get like, again, a view of the, the breadth and depth of all these things. So that we, when we talk about burnout, we can understand um, why care partners in particular are at risk of this. So first of all, we're looking at physical tasks that care partners have to take care of. So patients living with a chronic illness, undergoing medical treatment, they're physically exhausted. It's very hard to find the energy to move your physical body to do things around the household. Um, so often that becomes the care partner's responsibility. So some things that the care partner might be physically responsible for that their body has to take on as a task, vacuuming, cleaning surfaces, doing laundry for multiple different family members, organizing different household items and spaces, transportation to different appointments, to school, after school activities, cooking multiple meals a day, which is physically engaged. You're on your feet, you're moving back and forth, you might be reaching up to get things, you might be getting different equipment, that's physically quite a bit of work. Um, providing childcare throughout the day, that can be very physically exhausting. Uh, and running errands around the community. All of these things involve using your physical body. Um, it's especially a factor for care partners who might have to um, support medical treatment by doing heavy lifting or movement, um, either of the medically affected partner or any equipment. Anything that might support their pain management and involves moving their body, the care partner is going to be taking that on too. So your physical body is taking on a lot of tasks as a care partner. What about your emotional body? You know, your, your spirit, your heart. Um, that stuff isn't really discussed as often when we talk about being a care partner, but it actually represents some of the most important work that care partners do. So that can involve supporting a partner through ongoing or recurring feelings of grief, loss, anger, fear, doubt, shame, um, existential, religious, spiritual challenges. Those are a lot of very difficult feelings. And we know as loving, caring partners, that's us kind of, you know, providing that that space for our loved one to process these things and go through this. Uh, and, and part of that work is providing soothing and therapeutic words, affirmations and touch, um, and just generally managing the increased existential worries and anxieties in the household and questions of mortality, especially if we have kids in the house. That's going to be a part of the care partner's emotional tasks um, is to have these conversations with children in the household, no matter what age they're at and help validate their feelings, hold space for them, um, provide those kinds of soothing words for them as well. Um, and another aspect of the emotional work that care partners have to do is making and canceling social plans, depending on how the partner is doing. So for folks who might be having a flare up or might be having a really bad day, we might need to cancel some plans. Oftentimes that can be the care partner who's kind of doing that work. So you're managing the social relationships in your life as well, if your partner doesn't have that energy. And that's again, on top of the physical stuff. So then we get to the cognitive stuff. And that is really anything that involves thinking. 
it, which is a lot of things. There's a lot of things uh, in a day, in a week, in a month that a uh, care partner has to think about and plan out in order to run the household. So that can involve handling administrative tasks around the house, paying bills, um, liaising with service providers. Maybe your fridge breaks down. You got to call someone to help fix that. Um, managing, again, repairs and maintenance on the house, maybe the car, um, scheduling things with the family, um, planning meals, the cleaning schedule, shopping, tracking household resources. If there's a medication regime that needs to be followed, the care partner is going to need to get familiar with that. They're going to need to fold that into their cognitive labor and into their sort of schedule. Um, and we know a caring care partner is going to want to stay up to date on medical literature, research. Um, they're going to be actively engaged in reading about their partner's condition and any sort of new or effective treatments that might be coming out. There's going to be a lot of cognitive work on that level as well. Um, so it really represents just a general increase in executive functioning demands every day, every week, every month. You just have that much more to do because your medically affected partner is working on getting better uh, or improving their symptoms. A lot of their energy is going towards managing the illness um, that is causing this depletion of energy. So it's sort of, you know, the, the that extra load becomes a part of the care partner's work. Um, and again, so many different areas of life. Uh, it makes sense that care partners are a group of people that are prone to burnout uh, and that very, very much at risk for it. Because if you look at, again, just the sheer number of these tasks, it's a lot for one human to take on. So when we think about burnout, what is burnout? What does it look like? What does it mean? How does it happen? So um, James and Gilliland in 2017 wrote a text on crisis interventions, which we've used for a lot of the basis of these next couple of slides, because really when we're thinking about avoiding burnout, like burnout is a crisis state. It is, um, it is a space that we have gotten to slowly and eventually over time, and it makes us non-functional. So their sort of definition for it um, is it's, it's people who become so overwhelmed by demands in their life that they lose physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual energy necessary to function in essential areas of life. So that slow, steady progression of symptoms pile up over time and they build towards a crisis state. So burnout isn't something that happens like you're fine one day and then the next day you're burnt out. It's something that happens in stages and it increases over time. And the good news about that is that we can, when we know what's happening, we can kind of intervene at different points to stop it from getting worse and progressing to worse stages. So part of figuring out what it is that's causing burnout is what are the risk factors? What is it um, about our situation that um, might lead to us burning out? So there's six different major sources that they've identified. Uh, the first one is role ambiguity. So there's unclear expectations for the roles and the responsibilities of the care partner in this case. So you're not really sure what it is, what part of, you know, running the household and running the family is your responsibility. Now, that hasn't been discussed. So we're not really sure what we're supposed to be doing when. Um, a role conflict, a sense of conflicting values between the individual and the family unit. So that's really... Um, you know, if there's some some discord between who should be doing what and why um, and in what way. Uh, role overload, pretty straightforward. The amount or depth of work is overwhelming. Um, for care partners, this is usually one of the the sources and the risk factors that that is the most likely to um, to become an issue. There's just too much. Um, next one, inconsequentiality. So the feeling that the efforts that you're making, the energy that you're putting into this is unappreciated and it's not recognized. So you have an absence of recognition, of, of acknowledgement, of rewards for it in some way. Um, it, it really, you know, people aren't saying thank you <laughs> enough or aren't expressing that they see what you're doing and they appreciate it and they really have a sense of how much there is involved. Um, so it's almost kind of feeling invisible in a way, like it's inconsequential what you're doing. Um, and following on from that, similarly, is isolation. You don't have any support nearby. There isn't anyone supporting you in any way, shape, or form. You are isolated. Um, autonomy 
is um, if you are unable to impact important decisions and on, on processes in your life and on the way that things are running in the household. Um, so essentially, you, you don't have impact. You aren't able to speak up, um, share your perspectives, share where you're coming from, and have it make a difference in your environment. All of these things are going to make it much more likely that you'll burn out um, in the work that you're doing. Next, we're going to look at the different levels of burnout, because there are actually different types of burnout. Uh, and it's very important to think about what type of burnout we're experiencing so that we know how to apply an intervention and how to fix it, essentially. So different levels of burnout um, involve activity. So that is burnouts tied to one particular activity. Uh, it might be really intense, really high demand energy. It requires a lot of repetition and it depletes your resources for that specific activity. So for example, you might be done with cooking. You might be like, nope, I, I cannot, I cannot look at another frying pan. I cannot step into that kitchen. Um, my energy for cooking has completely burnt out. Can't do it anymore. Um, in which case, you know, applying an intervention there um, is a little bit easier because you can say, oh, we're doing takeout. For the next couple of days where we're reaching out to extended family members to get help with cooking. We're going to give you a break from that activity. The next one is state, which is when burnout is tied to a particular time and place. So that might actually subside when the environment changes, um, or if it keeps repeating, it's going to cause more anxiety. So the challenge for care partners here is that um, if that space, that environment is your home space, well, you have to be there. So what can you do around your environment to shift the parts of it that are stressing you out and that are causing that burnout? So it's it, it's sort of, again, it's leveling up as we go. First, it's just an activity, then it's an environment. And then the next one is trait burnout. So that's the most serious level where you've become so resource depleted that you are non-functional in your day-to-day -day life. There is no activity, there is no environment um, that doesn't deplete you almost immediately. And this is this is really the sort of crisis intervention point where um, something, an intervention does need to happen because otherwise harm will come to the care partner or the family unit. This is a particularly important um, type of burnout for medical professionals to think about as well, because this is the point where you might make mistakes in your medical practice. Um, so if a care partner is providing medication or a medical procedure in some way, it's really important that they don't get to this state because they might mess up the medication. This is really the non-functional part of burnout. So when we're thinking about um, how to track burnout and how it's happening to us, it's important to think about, is it an activity? Is it an environment? Is it everything? And then the next part of that is, what stages of burnout am I in? Because there are multiple different stages and there are different interventions to be applied at each one. The first one is enthusiasm. It's not really a stage of burnout. It's um, you're feeling hopeful. You're feeling prepared for the tasks ahead. Like you got this, you can handle it. But there might be some um, lack of realistic expectations. It might be a little too idealistic. Uh, it might be that you don't have a full grasp of exactly what it is that's involved in this. Um, and that can be sort of helped with different training programs, different seminars like this, um, people just kind of prepping you and letting you know that this is going to be a lot and there is a risk of burnout. Um, stage two is stagnation. So that's when you begin to feel as if important personal needs are not being met and you're starting to just kind of notice that something doesn't feel quite right. You're feeling a little bit too tired too often. You're getting these little stressful voices come into your head that say snippy little things. Um, and you're just sort of, there's almost a boredom. The word stagnation is very apt for this stage. It just feels like you're kind of stagnating and you're treading water almost. The third stage is active frustration. So you're showing signs of an impeded ability to, to function. Uh, you're struggling to manage obstacles and challenges, and you're starting to question the value of the work that you're doing. So it's essentially you start to it's you you are conscious now that there is a problem. The voices in your head have gotten louder. They've gotten way more snippy, and you are starting to falter at different things that you have to do. Um, your roles and responsibilities are not being met adequately. You're tired. You're you're really getting to burnout. This is one of the best places to apply an intervention because at this point in time, you still have some energy to do some things with and you haven't reached the fourth stage of apathy yet. 
So stage three is the one, whenever I'm looking over these stages to think about where I am, if I can feel that I'm in stage three, it's time for an intervention. It's time to change something. It's time to bring that up to someone and to start doing something differently. Because if we reach stage four, that's when we're really burnt out. You feel indifferent and apathetic towards multiple areas of your life. You're in a state of extreme imbalance and you are unable to move forward and in any area of your life and you are making big mistakes. And the worst part is you don't care because you just don't have any energy left. Your body, your brain, your spirit is done. And the danger of that, of course, is that that's where relationships break down and where harm really gets done. And then we kind of reach what is almost like the final stage of burnout in some ways. It's categorized as a separate thing, but it really is a kind of part of this process. And that's compassion fatigue. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You're so depleted. You are so drained of uh, resources after a really intense period of caregiving and lots of compassion and lots of sympathy and empathy. You have none left. You are fatigued of giving compassion. And the danger with that is, is that someone will come to you in pain and you will truthfully and fundamentally say, I don't care. I don't care that you're in pain. I don't have it in me anymore. And um, that's a that's not a great place to reach as a care partner or a you know a services provider because yeah again real harm can happen there both to the care partner to your relationship and to the affected person we really really want to make sure that we don't get to this stage um, because from a relationship therapy perspective this is really the point where things are said that you can't take back and that you don't necessarily mean because they're coming from a very burnt out tired body. So it, it becomes one of these things that we really, we want to intervene before it gets here. Uh, it's understandable when it happens because we're doing so much work up to that point that we have literally depleted our compassion battery. It is empty. It makes sense. But what can we do to notch that up again? Because our partner and ourselves and the people in our lives do deserve compassion, but we also deserve to have enough of it there to offer and not have it be completely depleted. So some questions that we can ask ourselves when we're thinking about resource management as a care partner, because one of the biggest challenges as a care partner is going to be managing resources, resources inside yourself, in your partner, your family, and the household at large. Uh, and all of the literature on care partners and chronic illnesses point to this as being one of the biggest challenges that they have. You've got to take on keeping track of physical, mental, emotional, technical resources, and that overwhelming, again, becomes a thing. And remember in burnout, when it's overwhelming, that's when it starts to progress through those stages. So these are some questions that um, care partners should consider in order to help offset the load of resource management that you have. So make a list, honestly, make a list of the physical, mental, and cognitive tasks that are involved in being a care partner for you as an individual. You'll be amazed when you sit down and make that list, how many things are on it. And all of those things are valid needs. If that is a need that you have, it's important that it be written down somewhere and, and, and thought about. So which tasks are the most exhausting or downright impossible for your partner to do? Which things are, are not, you're not going to be able to rely on your partner for support for that because they are managing their energy someplace else. This is a thing they can't do for one reason or another. Which tasks are the most exhausting and stressful for you to do? Make note of those. That will be important when we get to the next section of questions. Um, which tasks come very easily to you? Which ones take very little energy and can even be like a mindful focusing break for you? Which things need to get done, but can actually be a space for you to kind of relax and come down? I used an example earlier of burning out on cooking, but cooking might be your mindful, safe, like peaceful space might make yourself some tea, put some music on and just spend an hour and a half or so just chopping vegetables and focusing on that. Um, maybe it's uh, sweeping the floors. My partner likes to put on disco music when he sweeps the floors and uh, that those floors are clean after that. And that's like a nice, you know, restful sort of fun place for him that that gives some things back to his battery while it's also completing a task. So what kind of how can you marry these things up? Um, your self-care needs and the household tasks needs. Um, and again, how can you just organize all the tasks that you have to do in a way that makes them easier? 
that's going to be a really important question um, to consider when you move forward on how you're you're saving your own energy and time. On the same level, what can be offloaded? What family members in the household or outside of your household can step in and take over certain tasks for you? Um, and what tasks can you hire someone else to do? What's in your budget for that? Because any time and energy that you spend on a task, that's time and energy out of you. If you have money that you can put towards someone else providing a service for that, um, save your time and energy. If you don't have the money um, to do that, then again, how can you make these tasks easier to do? What can you do that streamlines these things? And again, on that level, what are my support systems and when can I activate them? Which family members, friends, neighbors can be called on to help with some of these tasks? Who is best at what in your life and who is most willing and available to help? Call in the troops. When is it time to call them? That's another question. How will I know when it's time to call them? Check those burnout stages again. Check where you're at. If you're at stage three, it's time to call some people in. You are entitled to call for help and it is actually very necessary that you do so that you don't reach that stage four. Um, so again, some of your resource management involves other people that you're connected to. So the next section we're gonna take a look at is self-regulation. Um, which is also a really challenging part of treating burnout in care partners, because a lot of the time a care partner is going to prioritize the medically affected partner's needs. Um, the measure of health in a household is often, how is that partner doing? How are they doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Whatever. How are they doing? Um, and that's natural. That makes sense. But the fact is, is that our minds, bodies, and spirits are like machines. They need maintenance and they will break down without it. And they will progress through those burnout stages. Um, they need their oil changed. They need the tires rotated. You need maintenance. So here are some questions that you can keep in mind when you're trying to protect against burnout. Similar to the last slide, um, make a list, again, of your own personal needs on a physical, emotional, social, and cognitive level. Make a list uh, and then go through them all and ask these questions. What needs isn't being met and why not? How important is that need to my functioning? If that need is important to your functioning, it's got to start and you've got to figure out how to meet it. Is it something that you can address easily and without a lot of effort or planning ahead of time? Is it, do you just need five to 10 minutes of a little mindful break every now and again that you can just take as you need it? Or do you need to prep and plan something ahead of time? Is it going to take something that you need a specific resource, a person or a date or time for? Is it a couple of days away somewhere, a break from the house? Maybe you've, you've reached that state burnout and you are just burnt out on the house and what you need is a couple of days away. How can you arrange that? Um, can you do it with your partner? Can you do it with a family member? What is meeting that need look like for you? Uh, another really important question is what aspects of your identity that are not connected to being a care partner, have you had the time and space to nurture? Um, have you, was there a hobby that you were really involved in and really identified with that isn't getting your time and focus anymore? Um, is there something that is really, really important to you from a, a spiritual or emotional perspective that, again, that's not getting the focus? How can you bring that in, um, in meaningful ways? Do you have a safe space, person, or situation for exploring and reflecting on your feelings? Um, whether that's friends, family, therapy, you need to get the feelings out. You need to do the reflecting. It's part of the maintenance. Um, are you being honest with yourself and your partner about your needs and things that aren't being met? This also comes up a lot in the literature on care partners is that they protect their medically affected partner by I'm fine. I'm good. Don't worry about me. I'm all good. You worry about you. Um, but that, that can lead to burnout too. Um, so are there any hidden stressors or depleting depleted batteries that you're protecting them from knowing about? Are you afraid that bringing up your own needs will be a burden on them, which is, usually what the thought process is. But then what are the dangers of continuing to hide that from them and potentially increasing your symptoms? What could that lead to? And how would they know if you told them? How would their awareness of your challenges impact your care partner? Um, and are those things that, that you could work on together as a couple or as a family? Is there something that you could do um, that, that fills both of your batteries back up? And you just don't know that until you talk about it. So again, a lot of these, these questions in particular are tough for care partners because 
it, it forces them to think about their own feelings and experiences and center those in a conversation with a partner that, um, you know, they often want to protect from any more negative feelings, any more negative sort of things. But these aren't negative feelings. These are needs that you have as a human and that you can maybe meet together as a couple. Um, and a part of that is, again, have you adjusted to the new normal of your situation? There is a new normal here. Um, have you taken the time to gather to grieve and mourn the loss of your old normal? What can you do to process and validate those feelings? What are the challenges of the new normal? And are there any aspects of that old normal that you can incorporate in in meaningful ways? One of the things that my family and I did um, when we were going through some cancer diagnosis and treatment experiences was um, I held art lessons for them every week for a couple of months. And it was just a mindful, connecting, creative activity that we did that wasn't focused on the illness. Uh, it was focused on building moments and memories together, um, increasing our skills, just kind of getting the chance to come together and connect. And they were some really special times that we would not have done without this new normal in place. But it represented a little slice of the old normal we used to have in making things together. And that was very healing for everyone involved and the care partners involved all felt like, you know, they were getting their needs met too. We were sharing something. So what can you do as a family and as a couple that incorporates some of those things that you love to do together and helps you focus on those moments and connect instead of always just kind of running around having to attend to um, some of the more stressful aspects of what the new normal is. So those are some questions to think about for self-regulation and validation, which as we've learned, were very important in, in addressing burnout. And now we're going to look at some interventions that are both preventative um, and so sort of following along from this and um, that can actively help if we are dealing with burnout already. So there's three different pathways for supporting care partners at risk of burnout preventative training and therapeutic programs, interventions in the household, and interventions with the individual. So training is um, really, you know, seminars like this one, um, things that focus on finding balance between care work and personal needs, setting and achieving realistic aims for our family and ourselves, um, and it helps build that strong foundation that they can support their family members from without burning out. Um, and taking part in therapeutic groups and programs. I know a lot of people are hesitant to do that, but it makes such a difference to have a space to be able to explore and express and reflect on um, the experiences that we're having, the feelings that we're having, um, and to hear validation back from other people and to know that you're not alone. Um, that does a lot to sort of fill our emotional batteries back up so that we're not burning out on that level. Um, and we, again, if we have a space to talk about these things, it's much less likely that we'll stage, we'll uh, reach stage four in burnout. So interventions in the household um, can kind of involve the daily operations and the familial values. These things are going to have a real impact on um, the pathway to recovery from burnout. And it also helps prevent them to begin with. So one of the biggest things, again, and I can already hear care partners being, oh, wouldn't that be nice? It's, it's, yeah, it would be great. And it's kind of necessary for avoiding burnout, a manageable workload, both in depth and breadth, um, and an insistence on regular breaks and time limits for highly stressful tasks. So going back to that last slide about resource management, if you know a task is highly stressful for you, we've got to put a time limit on how much of it we do in a week so that we don't burn out on it, both from an activity perspective, a state one, and a trait perspective. Um, burnout perspective, um, because it it really is that overload and that overwhelm is a big, big factor in burnout. A positive, vibrant environment from your household decor to the shared family values and goals that people work together collaboratively. It's not always easy to get your family on board with being positive when there's been a diagnosis or there's a chronic illness going on. But again, when we come back to that sort of finding special moments to connect, um, having gratitude for the things that we do have and, and making sure we highlight those and think about them and hold them just as much as we're holding our frustrations. Um, and again, sometimes just the, the positive environment, doing something together. There was some folks I know of who uh, did a family mural together on the wall and it was a very special, it helped them literally visually when they walked in. It was a good reminder um, and in the process of it. 
a well-organized system for dividing household tasks with varied forms of support from extended family and community members, people who are there to keep an eye on the care partner. If you can assign someone from your family or community to look after the care partner's needs the same way the care partner is looking after the medically affected partner, great. Just someone to do a check-in every now and again, make sure they're, they're eating well, they're sleeping okay, and they have space to talk about things if they need to. Um, and if you're organizing, again, your system of tasks, it's much less likely that you're going to be taken off guard with more of them and, and have that kind of sense of overwhelm. So similarly, specific time and space for care partners who discuss their emotions and their experiences with qualified health professionals. If you can get access to one, if you can get a therapist, if you can get in a group, um, if you have close family and friends, make use of those resources. And specific time for them to incorporate faith and spirituality into your wellness routine, um, if that's something that uh, works for you. If it provides a lot of existential soothing and emotional comfort to kind of incorporate those, those routines and those aspects into life. If we go to church on Sundays, that can be a nice, safe, healthy, mindful space for connecting with ourselves and our spirituality. Um, if we have other little groups that we go to where we explore these things and we get to talk about these things, that can do a lot to fill our batteries back up. And lastly, it's positive reinforcement and open displays of support and care that are showcased to the care partner, um, both from the medically affected partner and from family, friends, and community members. This sounds sort of, you know, um, intuitive and like it might be a small thing, but it's actually huge to receive a thank you, uh, or I really appreciate that, or that really means so much to me. That does a lot to protect against burnout. Um, anyone who's ever received a really well-timed thank you when they really needed it and has just kind of felt the stress melt off them, like, ah, oh, thank you for saying thank you. I really needed that. That was great. Um, that makes a big difference. So the medically affected partner can do a lot to, to help their care partner by just saying, I really see all the work you're doing and I want you to know I really appreciate it and it really means a lot to me. Um, those things can help. So interventions within the individual. So it all depends on the stage of burnout that you're at and the, um, again, the, the level of it, is it activity, state, or trait? Um, so those who are in stages two or three, there's a couple different actions that you can still take at that point to kind of prevent it from moving any further. A direct action is something that you apply externally to the situation um, so that like you, you get some time off maybe, you shift your tasks, you attend a workshop or training or a support group, um, something in your environment has changed around you to help support that recovery from burnout. Palliative action is something that's applied internally to your thoughts, your emotions, and your reflections on the dynamic. So that can involve um, health and lifestyle changes, going to personal therapy and engaging in changing thoughts and emotions with a professional, doing leisure activities, and finding ways to inject humor and joy into your life. Uh, it's not always easy in some of these situations, but it makes a really big difference. Um, so some of the little self-care things that we can do, I've listed here, we still have a bit of time. Um, ensure you're meeting basic needs. I know that's not going to be easy for care partners. Again, I can hear people being like, oh, wouldn't that be nice? It Yes, as much as you can. It, it, that should really be priorities because again, our bodies are machines. They need maintenance. They need sleep, food, and exercise. Um, they are revitalizing activities. And when you need them, try to make time for them and find energy because it will give you energy back. It will reward you. It's annoying how much it rewards you. Uh, it really is. Um, ensure you're getting the occasional mental and emotional break from those high stress texts. So we've mentioned that a few times. Um, and again, it, it might sound unrealistic to people who have to do these tasks on a really regular basis ongoing, but whenever you can get yourself a break or get support on it, that will help you avoid burnout. Um, cultivate a sense of humor and levity about some of the situations that you're in. That's, that makes a really big difference. If you can laugh about something instead of cry about it, your body is going to feel that. Uh, I mean, both things address cortisol levels in a different way. Crying and laughing both release cortisol, but laughing does it in a sort of less stressful way if you can manage it. Um, both are fine. Both are absolutely fine. But whenever you can laugh, laugh. Exercise choice and autonomy in the direction of your personal therapy uh, and find achievable short-term goals that meet your needs. 
So again, that autonomy piece from earlier, it's really, really important that you have a space where your voice is heard uh, and where you feel heard and seen. Um, find a leisure pursuit that brings you some peace, relaxation, distraction. You deserve time in the day where your brain is not thinking about these things. Um, because again, it needs a break. It's a machine. If it doesn't get a break from thinking about this, it will habitualize going, 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 going until it breaks down. So if you can teach it and habitualize it into having a little bit of a break, whatever that looks like, um, it will make a big difference to its maintenance. Same level, a process which cultivates mindfulness, awareness, resiliency, meditation, journaling, quality time in nature and with family and friends. So things that are restorative, that, that fill that battery back up again. We, we just can't work with an empty battery. We need to engage in things that are filling that back up. So some of those activities work for people. It's all individual, but um, things that are contemplative and calm and connecting. Similarly, um, a physical activity that provides health benefits, really helpful. Whatever it is that, you, however you like to move your body, try to do that. Is it rock climbing? Is it rock uh, running or walking? Is it a team sport? Um, is it something that you can do? Is it just sort of like floor exercises? Keep your body moving if you can. Um, and then similarly, a creative activity, something that provides a positive sense of emotional and spiritual growth, something that helps your brain kind of distract itself and be in a different realm for a while. Um, there's lots of different creative activities you can engage in that will help provide that sort of soothing and that, um, that peaceful space. So lastly here, I just have some assessment tools in case anyone's interested. Um, most of these assessment tools are for human services workers, so counselors, therapists, nurses, and things like that. But a lot of that kind of work really overlaps with care partner tasks. So I think they're pretty relevant for care partners. Um, so they're just tests and scales that um, you can find on the internet if you you know, want to screenshot this and um, Google some of these things. Some of them are readily available online. Some of them you do need to buy, um, but they all measure different things and different levels of burnout, um, the things in the environment that might be causing it. So you can go over the, the, the seminar stuff that we just looked at in terms of the levels, the stages, the types, and you can think about how you might fit into that. And you can take these tests as well. And these tests will give you some information about where you're at. Um, and it's it's great learning for yourself to look through these things and just kind of get a lens for it in your own life, because you will use this information in years to come. You'll It'll be years down the road and you'll think, oh God, I am burnt out on this specific thing and I'm at level three and I need a, an, an intervention for that of some kind. It's takeout night, you know? Um, so these tests can be helpful for just giving you some more information about yourself and where you're at. Um, and then I've got my references for the seminar. So that is it for me. Uh, if anyone has any questions, they can shoot me an email um, at hello at maythorncounseling.com. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks very much, everyone.